There's a lot of talk that Biden will be replaced at the DNC. What are your views on this? Well, he might be replaced. I've said that myself. It's not a hard, fast prediction. I didn't put a stake in the ground, but I certainly, I raised that actually last summer in 2023 as a, as a possibility, and I have written about it, and it could happen. Uh, if it happens, it won't be at the convention. It'll be uh, really at the end of June, beginning of July, you know, in, in the coming weeks. Um, you, you had to wait till the primary season was over. And it's not quite over yet. It's over next week. Uh, so you want the primaries to be closed because you don't want, you know, Gavin Newsom suddenly running in the Texas primary or whatever's left. There's just about, I think, four or five states left uh, first week of June. Um, so you don't want that chaos. But on the other hand, you can't wait until the convention because you want the convention to run smoothly. So if you're going to do the substitution, it would have to be mid to late June, early July at the latest. So we'll see. But I consider that a real possibility. Hi, and welcome to Wealthy On. I'm James Conner, and today my guest is Jim Rickards. Jim has had a fascinating career as a lawyer and a banker, and he's the author of many bestsellers. And we're going to tap into his knowledge today and get his thoughts on where he thinks the economy is and also what he thinks of the current political landscape. Jim, thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Portsmouth? Uh, things are fine, Jim. It's uh, a little rainy, but uh, you know it's a nice town. Uh, lots of great restaurants, uh, lots of activity, so uh, very, uh, very enjoyable. I'm going to have to make a trip there sometime. I want to start a conversation now with geopolitics, and there's so much turmoil in the world. We have an ongoing conflict in the Middle East. We still have an ongoing war in Ukraine. There's the ongoing threat of China invading Taiwan. And why don't we just start with the Middle East? What's your current view on how things are unfolding there? And do you see the threat of a uh, regional expansion in the Middle East? Yeah, uh, the, the Middle East situation is pretty simple. People keep trying to make it complicated. But uh, uh, there were at the start of the war, that when the October 7th attack took place, the largest uh, mass murder of Jews since the Holocaust. And that's what happened and, and worse than murder. Uh, in many cases, um, don't need to go into all the details, but I think they're pretty well known. Um, so there were about 40,000 Hamas fighters. So Israel's goal was to kill 40,000 Hamas fighters. There are civilian casualties, there's a lot of infrastructure damage, but you got to kill basically 40,000 fighters. You don't actually have to kill them all. You probably have to kill 30,000 plus the top leadership to basically render Hamas done or gone as a fighting force. Um, estimates vary. They probably killed over 25,000. Uh, they probably have to kill five to 10,000 more. They've wiped out Gaza city. And, uh, I think it's Ka, uh, Giannis is, might get the name slightly wrong. That's one of the uh, other cities in central Gaza. They're down to the last city, which is Rafa. Biden told them not to go into Rafa. No one cares what Biden thinks. He says stuff all the time, but no one takes him seriously. Uh, Netanyahu knows what he has to do. So they're in Tarafa now, killing as many Hamas fighters as they can. It'll probably take, you know, hard to say, but maybe another month to six weeks to finish the job. And then there'll be a ceasefire because there won't be any Hamas left. You can get into, you know, I love the $320 million we spent on the humanitarian aid pier that fell apart in a couple of days, not, uh, apart from wasting $320 million, not exactly a, compliment to the CBs, the Army Corps of Engineers, or whoever built it. I mean, it's, it's, I'm glad those guys weren't in charge of D-Day. They probably would have invaded Ireland. Uh, but um, uh, from a policy point of view, Biden is kind of irrelevant. Israel's going to do what they have to do. And what they have to do is simply just have to um, annihilate Hamas. And let's move on now and look at Ukraine, Russia and Ukraine war has been going on for two over two years now. It's hard to believe. But how do you think this situation is resolved? Well, it's resolving faster than I expected. Uh, Ukraine is uh, they've there are about 500,000 dead Ukrainian soldiers. So I hope uh, I hope Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan and Victoria Newland are happy with that because they, they said they'd fight to the less Ukrainian and they're doing a pretty good job. About 500,000 dead. Um, uh, Ukraine's military is in a complete state of collapse. They are, if they're fighting, they're losing. Uh, many of them are surrendering. There are mutinies. Uh, there are desertions. Um, when they retreat, it's not an orderly fighting retreat to a defensive position. It's more like running for your life. And the Russians are annihilating them with uh, drones and uh, uh, um, you know heavy uh, uh, 
um, heavily armored helicopters, uh, bombers, uh, other other weapon systems, minefields, etc. Um, they're now sending 70 year olds out. They're sen- sending 17 year olds out. When I say they, I mean the Ukrainians. Uh, they've instituted a draft. I haven't been there, but I get a lot of pretty good intelligence. They say um, the streets of uh, Kharkov, uh, Kiev, uh, Lvov are, are empty because, um, you know, men, younger men, say between 17 and 30, are just are hiding or leaving the country or, or staying inside because they don't want to be, you know, dragooned off the streets and sent to the front lines. They say if you get to the front lines, your life expectancy is about three hours. That's how long it takes for the Russians to kill them. Um, so, uh, they're getting beyond desperate. Um, the wonder weapons have all failed. We sent them high Mars precision got it utility as artillery, rather, um, precision missiles that took the Russians almost no time to figure out how to jam the GPS. So the missiles don't know where to go. They just go off course. We sent them Patriot anti-missile batteries, a billion dollars a piece. I think we sent about nine, uh, the only problem is that those missiles, bat- those anti-missile batteries cannot shoot down hypersonic missiles. The Russians have hypersonic missiles, so they've been blowing them up one at a time. There aren't many left. They got Challenger tanks from the UK, Leopard tanks from Germany, Abrams tanks from um, the US, and also Bradley fighting vehicles from the US. They've all been left burning on the battlefield, completely ineffective. The armor is ineffective. Um, so one by one, you know, the Storm Shadow missiles, most of them are shot down. They're pretty much out of them. They're out of 155 millimeter artillery shells because uh, the Russian economy is making uh, like a million a month. They're on a complete war footing. Western economies, the U.S. is struggling, struggling to open one factory that might make 30,000 a month, or sorry, 300,000 a month, except it's not open. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're still trying to do that. And our own supplies have been depleted. Uh, this is not just a question of our, uh, Ukraine losing. It's a question of Western arsenals being stripped. Uh, all these weapons are defective anyway, meaning they're obsolete and don't work against uh, Russian uh, offensive capabilities. But even allowing for that, we don't have anything left. Uh, so everything and the economic sanctions. I mean, I, I, I teach a course in the financial warfare at the U.S. Army War College. I told my class it was over two years ago, um, this April 2022, right after the war began, I said the sanctions will fail. Uh, U.S. sanctions on Russia will fail, but it will be worse than that. Not only will they fail, but they'll boomerang and hurt the U.S. economy more than it hurts Russia. Uh, I, I just looked at the data. Um, I, I don't have it all at my fingertips, but by every significant metric, unemployment, inflation, GDP growth, debt to GDP ratio, um, uh, manufacturing PMIs, et cetera. Russia, the Russian economy is greatly outperforming the U.S. economy. Um, and in particular, the one that caught my eye was debt to GDP ratio. Russia is 17%, practically debt free. The U.S. is, uh, we mentioned about 125%, way, way past the point where the debt can create enough growth to even pay the debt. Um, so, uh, so nice job, uh, Janet Yellen. Nice job, Wally Adeyama, the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury. The sanctions have been a complete failure, but they keep upping the ante. They keep the newest thing is to steal three hundred billion dollars of U.S. Treasury securities owned by Russia. That's a good way to sink the U.S. government securities market, um, and uh, it won't work. It, it, they might try to do it. They're, they're going to try to do it at the um, reach consensus at the G7 summit meeting in Apulia, Italy, which is coming up on June 13th. So just about two weeks away. Um, not clear what they'll do. There's some talk of floating a $50 billion bond issue backed by the Russian assets. Uh, it's just a backdoor way of stealing them. It's a structured solution to stealing the assets. Um, some talk about just using the interest, not the principal. Uh, that's about is, is there any, there, there's assets earning about three billion a month, so it's been two years. So there's about six billion of interest pile up. It's just an, a smaller theft instead of a three hundred billion dollar theft. They're all uh, part of why the world is trying to de-dollarize and get away from U.S. Treasury securities. Now, it does not mean if they do it and they're trying to do it, and I expect they will in some form. It does not mean the U.S. Treasury market collapses the next day. I mean, you, you hear of hysterical claims like that. That's not going to happen. But at the margin, um, it, it diminishes confidence in U.S. Treasury securities. And if you 
felt that and they do you were say you're a, a, a finance minister head of a central bank in a country that's running a trade surplus and you're getting dollars um and you have to decide what to do with the money no different than your clients how do you allocate your assets well all of a sudden you know u.s treasury securities don't look so good because the u.s is in the business of stealing them um do you like japanese government bonds german bonds or italian uh government notes any better i don't think so if you lose confidence in the u.s treasury securities market why do those other vassal states look better when it comes to their government bond markets so you pretty quickly end up buying gold. Uh, you don't have to be a gold bug. Just you as an asset allocator, if you can't trust the Western. I just mentioned the four biggest government bond markets in the world, Japan, Germany, Italy, and the U.S. If you can't trust them uh, and you want something liquid, you're not going to buy real estate, not with your reserve position. You're going to buy gold. And that's part of what's driving the price of, of gold higher. So, again, despite two years of failure, the U.S. and NATO seem to want to double down uh, with this stealing the Russian assets. And uh, the other thing Putin will do, or two other things Putin will do, and by the way, the thing that policymakers don't understand about Putin, he doesn't bluff. He actually thinks hard about what he says, what he's going to say, he gets a lot of advice. If he says something, you can put it in stone. He's going to do it. So he's already said, if the West steals these Russian assets, and as I mentioned, they're planning to do that, maybe in as early as about two weeks, um, he's going to expropriate all the Western assets in Russia. And guess what? There are more Western assets in Russia than there are U.S. Treasury securities in the Russian reserve position, well over 300 billion. Massive oil uh, infrastructure from uh, BP and, uh, and Shell, uh, other oil companies. Um, you can still buy a Coca-Cola in, uh, in Moscow if you happen to be there, uh, you know, to take the, take the Coca-Cola business. Uh, a lot of U.S. companies made a show. We're getting out of Russia you know, at the start of the war, but they uh, they didn't really. And they might have changed some brands, uh, and closed some outlets, but uh, there are still massive investments. So Putin will just take all that, give it to Rosneft or Gazprom or any of the other you know, large Russian companies. Uh, but that's not the most dangerous thing he can do, which I expect he will. $200 billion out of the $300 billion of Russian U.S. Treasury, Russian-owned U.S. Treasury securities that they're planning to steal are in a place called Euroclear. Euroclear is the largest clearing settlement and custody institute, institute in Europe, uh, comparable to our DTCC, not quite as large, but uh, quite large, with over $40 trillion of assets in custody. Um, they have offices around the world. They're based in Belgium, but they have offices in Hong Kong, Dubai, rep office in Beijing, office in Singapore, et cetera. All Putin has to do, uh, and uh, Hong Kong's an interesting case because it's um, it's under the thumb of the Chinese communists, but it still kind of walks and talks like a rule of law jurisdiction. They have lawyers and courts and all that good stuff. All Russia has to do is sue Euroclear in Hong Kong for wrongful conversion of its assets, get a judgment in its favor, run around the world enforcing the judgment by putting lien on other Euroclear assets that belong to other clients to settle the judgment. And you could throw a monkey wrench into the entire global monetary financial system. That this is the kind that, so these, these idiots at the treasury and the state department uh, and in NATO, uh, they're playing with fire and they don't, they don't even understand. I mean, what I just said was pretty clear. I happen to be a lawyer, so I understand this pretty well, but they, don't, they haven't even thought about it. Politics at its finest. So that's a good overview of what's happening in the Middle East and also Eastern Europe. So I want to bring it back home now. It's an election year and it looks like another Trump-Biden rematch at this time, but anything can change. And the RNC will be held in Milwaukee this year in July and Trump is undergoing an onslaught of legal attacks. Do you think he survives these legal attacks and will he become the next Republican nominee? Well, he, he will certainly be the nominee. He's already got more than enough delegates to do that. Uh, the And I expect he'll win the election also. Um, for, you know, it's, it's pretty clear in the polls. He's leading in national polls, which he's never done before. I mean, even when he won in 2016, he did not lead in national polls. National polls are kind of irrelevant because we don't have national elections. We have state-by-state -state elections to elect electors to vote for the president. Um but if you boil that down to the seven battleground states, he's leading in seven out of seven. Uh, he's leading in the betting odds. He's, by every measure, uh, Trump's ahead. And people say, well, polls can change. That's true. But 
right now, you know, May, June is about when people lock in their choices. They're not very open to persuasion. So I do think it's a, uh, it, it's a pretty good forecast of, of what's going to happen. Uh, so I would expect Trump to win. Having said that, he might not make it to Milwaukee because he might be in jail. Uh, we're you know kind of awaiting the verdict and the Alvin Bragg uh, farce. Um, but uh, uh, I, I don't know what the verdict's going to be. I do. I've done a lot of litigation. I work with some of the finest litigators in the world. They all tell me the same thing, which is that nobody knows what a jury's going to do. Like the you can have, you can spend millions, and they do in jury advice and jury selection research. And when they're interviewing potential jurors, they, they profile them and they do background all, all in real time. I mean, it's, it's quite a science, but having said that, uh, every good litigator I've ever worked with, and I've worked with quite a few says, you just never know what a jury's going to do. So I'm not going to forecast the outcome of the case. Um, if he's acquitted, that's a big victory. Even a hung jury is a, a very meaningful victory. If he's convicted, um, he might be in jail by July. So uh, now, of course, the case will be appealed, will certainly be overturned on appeal, but that takes time. So, uh, but just for viewers' benefit, there is no prohibition. Uh, well, there's, there's no, you can be a convicted felon behind bars and still be elected president. There's no disqualification or prohibition on a prisoner being elected president of the United States. So uh, I expect he will be, but it's just a question of how far the, uh, the Democrats want to take this uh, uh, unconstitutional, farcical, uh, farce, uh, um, you know, lawfare campaign. But we'll find out. So we have the DNC coming up in August in Chicago, and there's a lot of talk that Biden will be replaced at the DNC. What are your views on this? Well, he might be replaced. I've said that myself. It's not a hard, fast prediction. I didn't put a stake in the ground, but I certainly... I raised that actually last summer in 2023 as a, as a possibility, and I have written about it, and it could happen. Uh, if it happens, it won't be at the convention. It'll be uh, really at the end of June, beginning of July, you know, so in, in the coming weeks. Um, you, you had to wait till the primary season was over, and it's not quite over yet. It's over next week. Uh, so you want the primaries to be closed because you don't want you know Gavin Newsom suddenly running in the Texas primary or whatever's left. There's just about, I think, four or five states left uh, first week of June. Um, so you don't want that chaos. But on the other hand, you can't wait until the convention because you want the convention to run smoothly. So if you're going to do the substitution, it would have to be mid to late June, early July at the latest. So we'll see. But I consider that a real possibility um, for a lot of obvious reasons, including the fact that the man's senile and can't stand up. Um, now, uh, that aside, if he is the nominee, I, uh, they're already, uh, by the way, there's so many games going on. I'm going to give you a real quick example. To be on the ballot in Ohio for the presidential election on November 5th, the party has to have a nominee by uh, August 7th. The Democratic Convention is August 19th. Nice going, Democrats. They just assume the Ohio legislature would change the date. They didn't. Ohio legislature was like, no, it's August 7th. That's, you knew that. You picked your convention date. It's on you. So, um, so now the Democrats are saying, well, they're going to have a virtual convention, like a Zoom kind of thing, uh, uh, you know, or I don't know, some computer virtual digital convention where once the delegates establish their credentials, they'll nominate Biden by the end of July. Uh, and they'll do that because um, they have to beat the August 7th deadline. So even if they have a convention, I guess they will, but the the my understanding is Biden will not be at the convention because he can't really appear in public. He will already have been nominated by the end of July because they got to beat this Ohio deadline or else they won't be on the ballot November 5th. That's interesting. Um, and so the convention kind of becomes a joke. Ha having said that, there will be something going on at the United Center in Chicago and uh, kind of brings up memories of 1968, which I remember very well when uh, those were anti-war protesters who were beaten to a pulp by uh, Richard Daly, Chicago Police Department. Today, the shoe's on the other foot. The police department has been castrated. The mayor is a progressive, probably favors Palestine. And there'll be massive, massive pro-Hamas, pro-terrorist demonstrations all around the convention center. They've been denied permits to get too close. My guess is they, my estimate is they won't care. And there'll be police riot or confrontations. So, Democrat will be interesting. It won't matter because Biden will already be nominated. Biden won't be there because he's kind of non Um, But there will be riots in the streets. So, you know, uh, 
and probably keep away from Chicago at the end of August uh, if you're well advised. Sounds like it's going to be an interesting summer. Jim, as we wrap up, we are continuously being bombarded with negative news through social media, and we're always hearing how bad things are now compared to other periods in history. And when I read about the 60s and the 70s, so many tumultuous events occurred, including the assassination of a president. We had the Watergate scandal. We had oil embargo, which resulted in double-digit inflation and so much more. Do you think things are as precarious now as they were in the 60s and 70s? Yeah, I think they're worse now. And again, I lived through all those uh, the anti-war demonstrations. I was in college at the time. Um, uh, you know, yeah, I remember the assassinations. I was in seventh grade when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. We didn't quite know what to make of it. We all went home and watched uh, Lee Harvey Oswald get shot by a mafia hitman, you know, two days later, uh, Jack Ruby. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I remember it all very well. It was tumultuous, as you describe. Um but, and there was a lot of angst over it. There were riots. I mean, I remember the Watts riots in 1965, Newark riots in 1967. They were burning down cities. Anti-draft, uh, anti-war protests, the war itself. I knew people who were killed in the war and so on. So, uh, and then if you got into the late 70s, uh, a little later than the period you're talking about, yeah, uh, 15%, 13, 15% inflation, uh, the worst recession at the time since the end of World War II, um, you know, et cetera. So pretty wild ride. But through it all, um, nobody thought America was coming to an end. They thought that there, there was, you know, violence, turmoil, um, protests, political disruption. Watergate was a big deal. Maybe the first example of lawfare. You know, we talk about lawfare today. Maybe that was just an early case. Uh, Hillary Clinton was... Uh, uh, a staff lawyer on the House Judiciary Committee that was imp getting ready to impeach Richard Nixon. So uh, she got her training uh, training early, not the last we, we, we heard of Hillary Clinton. Um, but there was still a sense that America was America, despite our disagreements, and no one thought that there was a, a threat to the republic, even if there was a lot of political stress. Today it's different. Um, with the fascist and the Biden administration, um, you know, fascist goon squads in the FBI, uh, breaking down doors, no-knock warrants, permission to use lethal force against what? Uh, a, a fancy house in Palm Beach. <laughs> I mean, that's what they did. They broke down the door at Mar-a-Lago uh, and went in with like, a SWAT team mentality. Um, uh, you see people like Peter Navarro. Peter Navarro is a 73-year-old Harvard PhD economist, brilliant, mild-mannered, uh, but very determined uh, senior advisor throughout the Trump's first administration. He's behind bars. He's in a federal prison uh, for not uh, kowtowing to the FBI. So, um, you know, the surveillance of Americans uh, targeting Catholics, uh, targeting um, Imams for Liberty, which is a, a group trying to preserve, you know, basic educational functions. Um, so, I, I, you know, when you look at uh, Biden's September 19, uh, sorry, September 2022 speech at Philadelphia Independence Hall when he declared half the country enemies of the people, it was floodlit with the blood red uh, floodlights pointing up and two Marine guards on either flanks. It was uh, art directed by the ghost of uh, uh, Lenny Reifenstahl, who was uh, uh, Hitler's art director for the Nuremberg rallies. Uh, it, the lighting was identical to what the Nazis did in Nuremberg. So, so there are real threats to the Republic and real threats to democracy that uh, go beyond uh, political turmoil and political disagreement. So I do think it's worse today. Once again, I want to thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that discussion with Jim Rickards, and it gave you some insights on what to expect in the upcoming elections and also in terms of the economy. We all need help when it comes to planning and preparing for our financial future. And if you need help, consider having a discussion with a Wealthion endorsed financial advisor at Wealthion.com. There's no obligation to work with any of these advisors. It's a free service that Wealthion offers to all of its viewers. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, Wealthion.com, and also hit that notification button to be kept up to date on upcoming events. Once again, I want to thank you for spending time with us today, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.